I'm pleased to introduce our interview guest today, Dr. Drew Weissman, who together with Dr. Caitlin Carrico received the 2023 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Dr. Weissman received his bachelor's and master's degree from my alma mater, Brandeis University, in 1981. He received his MD and PhD in 1987 from Boston University, and this was followed by a residency at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. He then completed a fellowship at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases under the supervision of Dr. Anthony Fauci. <clears throat> he joined the faculty at University of Pennsylvania in 1997, where in collaboration with Dr. Cadel and Carrico, he explored the use of messenger RNA to drive heterologous gene expression in human cells. They overcame the notorious susceptibility of RNAs to degradation by packaging the mRNA in lipid nanoparticles and learned to both optimize protein expression and attenuate the inflammatory response to the exogenous RNAs by modifying bases in the RNA sequence. This work has revolutionized immunization technology and allowed for the production of the most effective vaccines to prevent COVID. Welcome to Pathogens and Immunity, Dr. Weissman. Thank you very much. Neil, why don't you get us started? What early influences steered you to science in general and immunology in particular? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's been so long, I don't remember the specific. <laughs> I remember as a kid, I was always interested in math and science and engineering. And I excelled at that through elementary, middle and high school. When I went to college, I spent summers doing basic science research in Harvard School of Public Health and, and other local universities. And that really exposed me to basic science. And I fell in love with it. When I went to med school, I did an MD PhD and primarily was interested in research. Were there any particular books that you read or articles that you read that really got you excited? What really excited me the most were journal articles from the early 2000s, uh, the early 1900s, going back to the beginning of, of journals. You know, the original Watson and Crick DNA description articles, tax description of a B cell rearrangement. There were just so many. And I was fascinated because to me, their technology was so limited. They didn't have PCR, they didn't have, you know, all the modern things we've got, but they made such incredible breakthroughs. So, why messenger RNA? What made you think of such a thing? I mean, why would you do that? Yeah, you know, my guess is it, it's an underdog thing. When I joined Katie at Penn, she had been working on RNA for eight or nine years and wasn't getting very far. And during her time working on RNA, there had been clinical trials using mRNA for cancer vaccines. They failed. There was no efficacy. And I think at that point, biotech and pharmaceutical companies said, this isn't going to work. It isn't worthwhile. You don't make enough protein. Gave up on it. And the world pretty much lost interest in RNA. When I met Katie, I was working on vaccines and I was working on loading dendritic cells with antigen and wanted to try every possible way. I had DNA and peptides and viruses and proteins. I didn't have RNA. And when I met Katie at the photocopy machine, she told me she works in RNA. So we started to work together and design immunogens to load dendritic cells as a vaccine. I'll add an extra little question here. Has anyone put a plaque on that photocopy machine? The photocopy <laughs> machine was, of course, replaced. You know, that, yeah. that was 26 years ago. <laughs> Journalists come here and they say, we have to photocopy you around a photocopy machine. Right. You find one. And it's really <laughs> hard to find photocopy <laughs> machines anymore. The real question I was planning to ask is, um, do you think the Nobel Committee should have recognized, along with uh, Catalan Carrico and yourself, um, the individual who first translated mRNA in vitro. 
we talked with the person who ran the Nobel Prizes. And one of the things that we brought up, I don't think he was happy, was other people that we thought deserved the award. Yeah. And, and that was one. And, and what he said is there were many of them. Uh, you know, two papers came out at the same time in 61 describing mRNA. And then th there were a series of papers isolating hemoglobin RNA from red cells and translating it, doing in vitro transcription. So there were huge numbers of people. The person that I thought should have been recognized along with us was Peter Cullis, who the invented the lipid nanoparticle. Was there a key observation that, that you made early on that made you think this would actually work? There were lots of interesting data points. As you know, in research, it's four steps back and maybe a step forward. So we were constantly doing experiments that didn't work. I think what helped us the most is that we tried to figure out why they didn't work. So we understood what the mechanism wasn't. And that started to point us into the directions of what it was. There were lots of interesting findings when we could easily translate RNA in cells. We could translate RNA in mice, except the mice got sick. And all of that led us to understand what the problem was and figure out the solutions. So every time I looked at a tube containing RNA, it degraded. Yeah. Um, and so uh, did you, were your colleagues and friends enthusiastic about your work or did they try to dissuade you from continuing? So I, I would go to HIV meetings in, in the early 2000s and I would talk to people I knew and some were very famous people and I would tell them about the RNA work and they would sit and they would nod and they would smile and at the end, they would say, you really need to switch to something interesting. You're wasting your career on RNA. It's never going to go anywhere. Yeah. So everybody tried to convince us that RNA was a, a fool's errand and, and we needed to do something else. I think that's just wonderful. That's fantastic. So what do you think are the most important elements in, in manufacturing and delivery of the mRNA? that have contributed to its success? We're using the same synthesis procedure that was the first one invented in vitro transcription using phage RNA polymerases. The procedure is better now, but it's the same enzyme system. So you're still using the phage polymerases? Yeah, and that's how Moderna and Pfizer and BioNTech and everybody else does it. What makes it expandable uh, and inexpensive and easy, it's a simple enzymatic reaction. There are no mammalian cells. There's no cell culture. There's no need for unknown proteins, media, serum, anything. It's a very straightforward reaction. And you can expand that reaction up easily. When J&J &J makes their adenovirus vaccine, they use 50,000 liter drums of Cho cells or other cells, right. and then they have to purify it. Moderna and Pfizer use 100 liter bioreactors and make the same number of doses or more of RNA vaccine. It's very easy to expand and, and produce. That's extraordinarily interesting because it's so much more efficient. And it's, Absolutely. It's the advantage of a biochemical reaction over a biological one. Yeah. A hundred liters, I could do that in my bathtub. Yeah, pretty much. And that's amazing. Yeah. So now I have a series of questions, or Michael and I have a series of questions having to do with the mechanisms, the detailed mechanisms by which um, the vaccines elicit immune responses. So do you have a, a complete accounting of what cells take up the RNA and then express the protein? We've done extensive analyses, both in mice and in macaques. The issue is from sensitive enough measurements, just about every cell takes up the RNA and makes protein. The issue is how much. If you do a cross-section of tissue, 
the dendritic cells are blaringly bright. They make a ton of protein. The surrounding cells make less. T cells make just about nothing. Uh, fibroblast keratinocytes, you can see a little bit of stain, but they're not very bright. The dendritic cells are making blaring amounts of protein, and they're the central player in, in initiating new immune responses. Is there any spread from the local site of immunization, or is it pretty much limited to the area where the injection takes place? What actually happens, and, and we're writing this up right now, if you inject a decent dose into a mouse, so 10 micrograms, and then look at its lymph nodes six hours later, just about every lymph node in the animal will have LNPs being taken up by dendritic cells. So the LNPs are 80 nanometer particles, essentially viruses. They distribute through the entire body and they home to dendritic cells and lymph nodes, to liver, to spleen, uh, and a few other organs. To me, it's really the LNPs are traveling, not the dendritic cells from the site of injection. There's been some noise recently about advantages in humans to immunizing repeated doses of vaccine on one side, on the ipsilateral side as the first, or on the contralateral side. Do you think that bigger humans would have a different distribution than your small mice? The big difference is if, if you give mice a human equivalent dose, and I don't know what that is, but yeah, yeah. It, it's low, you don't see LNPs everywhere, but you see them through the entire lymph node chain on the draining side. Whereas if you give protein antigens, you see one lymph node, the draining lymph node. The first one is the only one. The LNP spread to the entire chain. They don't spread to whole, the whole body because there's likely not enough and we can't detect it. That's quite interesting. In terms of the, uh, the spike protein vaccines, is the protein that's being produced secreted or expressed on the cell surface or both? The ones that we uh, worked with Moderna, BioNTech, uh, Pfizer, uh, Thailand, and a couple of others, those are all cell surface trimers. We've done comparisons of secreted trimers with trimerization motifs, and they work just as well. I don't know which is better. Functionally, they make the same immune response. And I think people, especially with all the craziness out there, don't want spike floating around the body. My understanding is that CureVac has an mRNA vaccine, again, focused on the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and they claim, as far as I know, that it was uh, created without modifying the bases, which is, you know, sort of been central to the conception of um, the vaccines for Moderna and uh, Pfizer-BioNTech. Um, what do you make of, of their findings? I think if you read their phase three paper, it tells you why it failed. When Moderna and, and BioNTech did their phase one trials, the induced antibody levels were three to five times higher than patients that have recovered from disease. For CureVax vaccine, the titers were, I think are like half or a quarter of what they were for patients. They claimed, so the, the phase three trial failed, that they had less than 50% efficacy. The, their claim was that it was that new variants appeared. I'm not sure I believe that. I think it was low antibody levels. Hmm. That, that's uh, very valuable to know. Yes. And uh, last in this series, um, what implications, uh, if you've thought about this issue, um, do you see for self non self discrimination in the variable results that you described in your 2005 paper and perhaps in subsequent work in terms of the ability to silence TLR signaling, uh, depending on what modification you were looking at? We did it as more of a mechanistic study, and we put TOL 7, TOL 8, TOL 3 then later RIG-I and MDA-5 and NOD-2 and others 
into 293 T cells or other cells that had no other sensors. And then we measured activation and we found some modifications didn't activate at all. They induced no signaling. Other modified RNAs still did. So A modifications induced normal signaling. U modifications didn't induce much of any signaling. Our conclusion was is that it's the U's in the RNA that are recognized as foreign. And when you modify them, that, that no longer occurs. So you can summarize it by saying that you defined you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, there, the two major vaccines that, that utilize your technology to, to limit COVID were Pfizer and Moderna. Are you aware of major differences in terms of how they're made or what they live in? There are minor differences. The untranslated regions are different. The coding sequence optimization is different. How they add their cap was done differently, but they both have natural cap one. The lipid nanoparticles have a different formulation. The ionizable cationic lipids are different. We've done vaccines across many different sequences, many different LNPs. They all act the same way. They all have the same mechanism of action. Their utility is a function of how well the RNA is translated and how well it's delivered by the LNP. So I, I see them as more improvements to the process, not different technologies. Is it the LNPs that account for the difference in cold chain requirements? It, it's complicated because the pKa of the ionizable lipid is calculated usually 6.4 to 6.7 as being optimal, but that's a pKa in an aqueous solution. If you measure the pKa in a lipid solution, it's about two to three points higher. RNA doesn't survive well in alkaline environments. It's degraded. So depending on what the lipid pKa of the ionizable lipid is, that may determine breakdown of the RNA. There's also lots of other reasons and in, instability and in, uh, in, in other components that determine uh, the, the, the survivability at, at four degrees. Is that instability that you just cited at higher pKa's uh, for RNA, is that just purely chemical or is that an enzymatic? Aspect? No, it's purely chemical. The, the yeah. basic environment degrades RNA. Very interesting. You have mentioned, and we sort of got to this a little bit earlier, about the paradoxical effects of immune sensing for your protein expression strategy. So how'd you figure out how much was enough in the human system and how much was too much? It was purely done in phase one clinical trials. We determined in mice what was the smallest amount that we could use. And it was a function of the delivered protein. Some vaccines we could give 0.01 micrograms. Others needed one microgram. And in humans, it was purely a phase one, what people could tolerate and they gave them the highest dose that they could tolerate. And would you expect that this same relationship would take place irrespective of the sequences of the message? The sequence of the message is important for how much protein is produced. And we find that protein production is a, is a predictor of potency. I don't know if you do teaching, but um, I do. And uh, if you talk to students about what is responsible, what are the factors that influence immunogenicity, the, the standard immunology textbook focuses on self, non-self discrimination. Um, some sources will emphasize what is called danger, in quotes, <laughs> as opposed to non-self. Um, how do you view that area, or do you have any thoughts about that um, conceptualization issue? When I grew up and trained in immunology, everything was self, non-self. 
And then Charlie Janeway and others came along with the inflammation hypothesis. My current feeling is that likely both are occurring. I think for immune recognition, inflammation is more important because you, you need to stimulate the immune system to respond. And non-self will do that, but it'll do it slower. It takes different types of cells. It takes often a, a acquired immune cells to do it well. The, the innate immune system recognizes inflammation and responds immediately. So I think for the initiation of immune responses to foreign pathogens and foreign elements, the inflammation is probably what I would lean towards. So how potent are the T cell responses, class one and class two restricted after immunization with COVID vaccines? They're variable. Uh, part of it is dependent on the antigen Part of it is dependent on the LNP. We've done head-to-head -head comparisons in macaques using adenovirus compared to mRNA. And with some antigens, the mRNA has a more potent T cell response. We know from the COVID vaccines that it's the T cell responses that are protecting people from getting very sick and dying. The antibody responses prevent infection, but with all the new variants, the antibodies don't work as well anymore. And we keep reboosting to try and refocus them, but it's really the T cell responses that protect people from serious disease. So that's the classic paradigm that we taught our students. Antibodies protect against infections and T cells protect against morbidity of disease. So would you see that there's a rationale or, or a goal to add some other viral elements into the COVID vaccines to enhance the diversity of T-cell responses? Certainly. Uh, the issue there is that when you add multiple RNAs, we've added up to 20 so far in a vaccine, each antigen is produced at a fraction of the total. So if you've got two RNAs, you get half as much protein. So if you start adding in other proteins, you'll get less spike protein and you'll get less antibodies. So it becomes a balance. Do you think it's possible to construct a COVID vaccine based on mRNA that would be capable of yielding sterilizing immunity? I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think when the Wuhan spike was around, and hadn't turned into variants yet, we saw sterilizing immunity in those first people vaccinated. And then the variants appeared and that was lost. The problem, of course, is that the variants are appearing so quickly and all over the world. I don't know if we'll ever be able to do that. We're taking a different approach. And we actually started this spring of 2020 even before we had a vaccine, we started working on pan-coronavirus vaccine. We submitted it to the NIH and the reviewer said it's not needed and didn't fund it. <laughs> but that, that, that was a separate argument. Uh, back then, you know, three coronavirus uh, epidemics occurred in 20 years. There's gonna be more, there's, that, you know, that back then there were gonna be variants we thought the pan-coronavirus was the way to go. We've got one now going into phase one clinical trials. So it may not give sterilizing immunity, but it may prevent against pandemics uh, or severe infection. What do you think about uh, um, designing a COVID vaccine that targets mucosal sites? We're working on that. Um, others are working on that as well. One of the big issues is that, in general, LNPs are toxic to the lung. We can give a mouse 30 micrograms, we can give them 90 micrograms IV, uh, and they tolerate it. But if we give them five micrograms inhaled, they don't do well. Wow. So there's a lot of toxicity. Huh. Companies have developed 
variants that have less toxicity. There's one in a clinical trial for replacing CFTR and cystic fibrosis. We and others are using similar ones to try and either intranasally, orally, or inhaled immunizations to, to, to induce mucosal immunity. In the, the toxicity, is it, is it the nasal mucosal, tracheal, or alveolar? The lungs bleed. Wow. So is, that, is that inflammatory, or is it just like a chemical, you know, sort of a chemical mechanism? You can't tell because bo both are occurring, but we don't know what came first. And it's related to the lipid? Well, we, we assume it, it, it's from the lipid nanoparticle. We touched on this before when you mentioned that the nanoparticles are taken up by a variety of cells, although most effectively by dendritic cells, antigen-presenting cells. You think that, that modifying the surface of the lipid particle targeting at a particular cell will get you selective expression? And is that something that you're working on? We've already published a few papers on that. We've been able to target lung uh, with anti-PCAM antibodies. We can target brain with anti-VCAM antibodies. We can target T cells with a variety of markers. What we published last year, we could make CAR T cells in vivo and cure a disease in a mouse. So instead of 10 days of half million dollar processing in a, in a fancy lab, we injected RNA LNPs and made CAR Ts and, and cured the mice. We published a few months ago, we could target bone marrow stem cells with about 60% gene editing efficacy. And we could do secondary transplants and retain that level. So we're, we're, we were targeting the repopulating bone marrow stem cells. All of those are moving forward into new therapies, new clinical developments. We have a big sickle cell anemia program with the idea that someday we'll be able to go to sub-Saharan Africa and the entire world, give people an IV injection of off-the-shelf LNPs and cure their disease. Wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. So, so um, do you think that you could use these methods to selectively target CD4 T cells containing latent HIV provirus and release them from latency? They're in macaques right now. We'll know the answer right. in a few Fantastic. weeks. Fantastic. I don't know if you've heard of this, but there's um, an investigator uh, at MIT named Kevin Esfeld, who had worked with um, David Liu, who's um, truly an outstanding investigator. And uh, then he worked with George Church. And I think he was involved, that is Esfeld, was involved with Church in, in developing gene drive technology. So he's, you know, he's a very competent re researcher, but he, he is not an immunologist as far as I know, or a virologist. And he put forth the notion on a podcast I heard that uh, when you're surveilling, um, you know, these uh, broad surveillance programs that the U.S. government has supported for potentially pathogenic viruses in the environment, his view is that you should do no experimental work on these pathogens. And you should be able to just look at the virus genome, pick out an antigen, make an RNA, pop it in a vector, and you have a vaccine. Um, I'm curious what your reaction to that approach would be. It's a bit conservative and a bit overbearing. I, I don't think we want to go around getting sewer water, sequencing it, and making vaccines to anything we don't know what's in there. We've got a program we've been doing with DARPA for a few years. It's in clinical trials right now that they call a 60-day cure. And what their idea was that they wanted to be able to go to anywhere in the world where a new infection just appeared, that they had no idea what it was. And it looked like it was lo spreading locally. They would give us a tube of blood 
And with that, we would sequence to see what the pathogen was. We would isolate B cells to make monoclonal antibodies and then optimize them and encode them as mRNA LNPs and give them to the local population to prevent the spread of the disease. To me, that's, that's a more realistic and, and useful uh, approach. I, I wanted to ask one other thing about the LNPs, which is, um, do you understand or is it understood how LNPs, I, my understanding is that they have an adjuvant effect. Is, is it known how that is working through what sensors or signaling pathways? Yes, yeah, so we don't know the sensors. We've excluded all of the toll, the, the helicases, the inflammasomes, the nods, all of the known and expected innate That's sensors. Quite interesting. Um, and on a quantitative, if it's possible to you know, assess the magnitude of the effect, is that anywhere near the effect of the non-modified RNA uh, inflammation? Yeah, th they're very different. So the, the non-modified RNA is typically a TOL7 or 7-8 uh, right. with maybe some rig eye and other helicases. It gives a focused TH1 profile. The LNPs have a, a completely unusual adjuvant activity. They induce T follicular helper cells. They're TH1 biased, but they're the, we've done measurements, a, a, a typical alum or MF59 vaccination, 5% of the CD4 helpers are TFHs. With mRNA LNPs, it's over 50%. So there's just a huge induction of TFH cells. And I think that's what gives such great antibody levels. Can you identify an effect of the LNPs? that um, is independent of the presence of an mRNA? Is it all due to the lipid? Or I mean, your readout is dependent on your, your message, obviously. But, but is, it, is the pathway independent of the presence of RNA? Yes, yeah, so we took empty LNPs with mm -hmm. nothing in them, right. added them to protein antigen, and saw the same thing. There are a lot of people out there who are reluctant to get immunized for one reason or another. How do you think scientists should address vaccine hesitancy in the public? It's a very complicated question, and it's, it's really new. When we were young, we always knew there were anti-vaccine people, and they weren't a big deal. Anti-vax people have been around since Jenner was uh, immunizing people for smallpox. What's different now is it's turned into a political crusade. And the, the far right, for whatever reason, thinks that vaccines are an attack on their liberty. Never mind society's importance in the world. It becomes personal freedom. And there's a huge number of reasons why they don't want vaccines. The big problem is they're supported by their leaders by the clergy, by politicians, by local leaders. And, and that's a problem because they're doing it for power. They're not doing it because they actually believe. Everybody in Congress got vaccinated, but a, a large number of them sit there and say, don't take the vaccine, it's bad for you. And they hire surgeon generals who try to make RNA vaccines illegal. Drew, that's brilliant. I didn't know that everybody in Congress had been immunized. Is it a, a rule or is it was it personal choice? Um, we don't know that. It was a rule uh, to, to be able to return to Congress in the beginning. Everybody had to be vaccinated. Everybody at Fox News was vaccinated. Here's another question about careers. Okay. Neil and I both trained as physicians. You did trained as a physician. Should every physician who's serious about a research career go to PhD school? I, I don't think so. I, I work with a lot of incredibly talented basic science researcher physicians. Um, they get their training and years of fellowship. And I don't think that's all that different than a PhD. 
I, I think the training is important. I don't think how you do it is critical. I would say, um, from my observations, that uh, as you say, there are just very many uh, MD only individuals who have done very basic research and made huge contributions. I was at WashU for my postgraduate work, and there were a number of examples there uh, at Penn as well when I was there earlier in my career. And um, but I think it ma matters on who the fellowship mentor is and whether they have an appreciation for basic science and fundamental questions. And I'm not against people who just have a clinical focus, but I think if the PI trainer is more clinically oriented, they may not transmit some of what you need to you know, develop a strong foundation and basic understanding of, of um, biomedical mechanisms irrespective of going to PhD school or not. Do you have any advice, Drew, for young scientists who are embarking on a research career now? Advice is worth a cup of coffee, maybe less. I'm asked a lot and I try to give reasonable advice. The personalities of researchers range the complete gamut, but the focus, the approach, the thinking are much narrower. And there are some people that just shouldn't be in research. If you can't tolerate frustration, you don't want to be in research. So there are some attributes that it's important. What I tell young people, and I talk to a lot of high school students, is that if you enjoy science, if you enjoy exploring, if you're curious, then give research a try. Uh, if, if your interest is in you know, doing the same thing over and over and over, then science isn't going to satisfy you. I mean, there is some of that in science, doing the same thing over and over and over. But <laughs> I, I take your point. <laughs> in fact, have you ever heard of Hershey Heaven? That was Alfred Hershey, who won the Nobel Prize with Luria and Delbruck and was involved in the early experiments showing um, that phage replication required DNA. I think that was one of his contributions. And he said that uh, Hershey heaven was when you could do the same basic experiment over and over and continue to get it really important results. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michael is the founder of our journal, Pathogens and Immunity, the founding editor, and I'm one of several senior editors. And the, the motivation Michael had for establishing this new journal, which is a very modest sized journal, terms of volume of papers and people supporting it, um, is to really modify the landscape of biomedical publishing so that we have more sensible uh, policies and practices that, that make it easier for researchers to actually get their work out and in, in in make sure it's of high quality. So for example, one of our chief features is that we allow people to submit uh, papers in any format that's reasonable, that's standard, um, without worrying about our format. And we only have them formatted in our format for publication if it's accepted, which saves a lot of wasted time reformatting submissions. Do you have any advice for journal editors like us to improve how science publishing works? I'm asked the same question by uh, people who oversee NIH referees. It's an incredibly difficult job, and I really don't know how it works and how to make it work better. You know, looking back, when, when Katie and I tried to publish our work 20 years ago and nobody would publish it, we, we, we wish there was a journal that was open-minded. Um, but, you know, I, I understand the problem. The journal gets 10,000 articles and can only publish 100. They have to have maneuvers, they have to have procedures, they have to have guidelines in order to publish. So I, I, I don't know how you overcome things like that. I, I like BioArchive because it gets the research out quickly. It's not peer reviewed, but at least you know it's out there and you know what's going on. Timeliness is important. And uh, our journal tries to respect that um, by making the submissions process exquisitely simple. It takes 
on average, much less fewer than five minutes to put your manuscript in our on our website. And um, we're open access, no charge to authors. We have a lot of things that make it different. And we pay our reviewers that that are a little different from from your your standard journal. But um, hopefully you'll hear more about us. And frankly, having you talk to us today is a wonderful thing for our journal and I think for our trainees who who come to our website. But now I've got to do, move a little bit off target and ask you, what sort of things do you do outside of the lab? What are you interested in um, outside of RNAs and vaccines? Unfortunately, because of, of how things have gone over the past years, most of those things have been lost. Uh, I just don't have time. In my old days, I, you know, my, my wife would joke when I got frustrated at work, I would come home and build something like a porch on the house or uh -huh. renovate a bathroom. Um, during the summer, I used to like to kayak every day and, and just get out on the water and relax. Unfortunately, things have gotten so busy between meetings and travel and everything else that there's much less time for that sort of thing. Well, then uh, let me give you an easy question to answer at the end. What's your favorite baseball team? Well, I have the issue that I grew up in Boston and all of my favorite teams are Boston teams. I, I was at the 76ers game Monday night and met the captains and had to smile and say, I, I, you know, Philadelphia is great. Uh well, Drew, listen, this was fantastic. It was wonderful to talk to you. Really, it was so good of you to um, to spend some time with us. Greatly appreciated. Uh, at, at the Not just that you participated, but the depth of your answers. Was yeah, they were wonderful. Really great. Very happy to do it. All right. Well, have fun and good luck to the Celtics. Yeah. 